Hello, hello. Welcome to this first uh, reading seminar of the academic year uh, from I3H. Um, we will have, uh, we are a bit unbalanced in terms of schedule because we will have three seminars uh, at, uh, on the last Monday of November, the first Monday of December and the third Monday of December. So, but uh, since uh, October was empty, uh, I thought that we could go back to the original formula, which is that we don't only present our own work, but also the work of others that may be of interest. Uh, therefore, the name Reading Seminar. And so my name is Mathias Watripon. Um, I co direct with Hilde Stevens uh, I3H under the presidency of our founder, Michel Goldman, who is online. Uh, Hilde is arriving soon. Um, so, and I thought, and we thought it was a good idea to uh, discuss this paper accounting for the widening mortality gap between American adults with and without a bachelor degree uh, by Anne Case and uh, Angus Deaton. Uh, Anne Case and Angus Deaton uh, have been doing uh, quite prominent work in the area of health and the economy. And they wrote this famous book, uh, Deaths of Despair, which we will discuss a little bit along the way. And this is their latest, uh, latest paper. Angus also uh, received the uh, Nobel Prize in Economics in 2015 for his work on uh, the microeconomics of consumer behavior. Um, now, I will, for most of the time, present the paper. Uh, I will not do justice to everything in the paper, which is uh, quite rich and uh, broad. In particular, while they talk about health outcomes from 1992 until 2021, I will stop at 2019, because I think the paper is much more about structural uh, uh, characteristics of the American economy and the American health system. And in a sense, COVID was uh, hopefully remains for now <laughs> a temporary event. And uh, looking at uh, the little virus, uh, the, uh, we should probably be OK, but we never know. Um, I remember there is this view uh, that people often have that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I saw a virologist with a t-shirt saying, what doesn't kill you mutates and tries again. <laughs> so, but let's see, let's see. Uh, so you can, the paper is referenced at the end. It's available on the web. Uh, and uh, it does go to uh, also uh, discussion of COVID. But the, the punchlines of the paper, are that the mortality differences between American adults with and without a four-year college, college degree uh, have increased a lot from 1992 to 2021. Uh, in fact, uh, as is usual uh, in our modern societies, from 1992 to 2010, both groups saw falling mortality. But, Strikingly, with greater improvements for the more educated. Uh, from 2010 to 2019, this is becoming really strange. While mortality continued to fall for those with a BA, uh, while rising for those without a BA. Uh, so the fact that mortality starts to rise did attract uh, a lot of attention. At the, at the beginning, uh, the, uh, the paper they wrote, which was just after the, 2000, the 2015 uh, uh, Nobel Prize, therefore it attracted a lot of attention, was to say, look, uh, at the time, white people without a BA started having falling mortality, uh, for a higher falling life expectancy. And that was only for, uh, for white people. 
and there the term death of despair and so on, I'll come back to it. Now it has, it is affecting also non-whites in the, in the US. Um, and then during the pandemic, mortality rose for both groups, unsurprisingly, but much more, as you will see, much more rapidly for the less educated. Now then, as I say, uh, you can, uh, I think some of the factors there are specific to, uh, to the COVID. Um, but so the numbers are really striking. The mortality gap between the two groups expanded in all three periods going from a 2.6 year difference in adult life expectancy in 1992 to 8.5 years by the end of 2021. So if you need to uh, remember one picture from this, it's, it was in the New York Times, uh, mortality gap between Americans with and without four year degrees widening. So we are talking about adult life expectancy. So conditional on being alive it, at age 25, uh, what is your life expectancy? So in 1992, for people with a college degree, and college, that means a, a four-year bachelor degree in the US, so after high school, uh, that was 54. So 25 plus 54 is 79. And that was a bit more than two years lower for people without a college degree. And then you see indeed that like in many countries, uh, things are improving, uh, keep improving until COVID for college graduates, uh, but stop improving for non-college graduates. And then of course, uh, I think college graduates lost one year and the others lost three years. Uh, you know, this had also to do with uh, with uh, not only available of healthcare, availability of healthcare, but also vaccination and so on. Um, to yes, give you, question. sorry, one question on the previous graph. So here they are something that like non college, these are people at 25, they didn't have college and they did not have college, right? So they probably the people who have been stopped, like the, you know. This is discussed in the paper. Indeed, uh, the assumption here is that uh, you get your college degree before 25. So it's not fully true, and they discuss it a bit. Uh, they say that it's, you know, uh, almost true. So the, the, the result is not, uh, is not really effective. Uh, as you will see, uh, the, uh, and they will say it, uh, uh, the US, when you look at, you don't have this kind of, numbers uh, in the same, in the comparable way for other countries. But uh, they do say in the paper that the college graduate curve looks like the European curve. Uh, the non-college ones are really the, uh, uh, the uh, exception. Uh, and you will also see that the average has implied that, uh, that the US has worsened a lot in terms of life expectancy in comparison to uh, to uh, other countries. Um, yeah. For the non-college people, do we know where they stop, when they stop exactly? Um, because it's it like the like of the, it, It's including anybody who tried university and dropped oh, out. So they all tried? No, so no, not, not, not anybody who did not complete a degree, but that includes those who went into university and did not finish. So, so today, one third of the US population, the adult US population, has a college degree and two thirds don't. By the way, in 1992, it was the number of people with the proportion of people with a college graduate degree was lower. And there is an issue of selection and so on because it's not the same population over time. But again, it doesn't look like it's a big deal. Um, Okay, so uh, this is what uh, this paper is talking about. And of course, there are lots of discussions about the, uh, the link with the economic system, the fact that the US doesn't have a good welfare state, that uh, in particular health insurance is not well organized and so on. For this audience, uh, I want to stress uh, more uh, the uh, 
the medical part and uh, you know where, where does this come from so um, in particular what I will show well what the paper shows is that uh, while there have been dramatic changes in the patterns of mortality across diseases uh, in, since 1992, the gaps for each disease between college and non-college has risen consistently in each of the 13 broad classification of cause of death. So this is really a, a big thing. Now, some, at some, for some, the, the gap is increasing faster, but still, uh, this is quite a, a broad trend. Um, then the paper ends with the uh, uh, some um, some uh, facts about uh, other types of well-being, but you know it's also related to the fact that you economists are focusing focusing too much on GDP, material welfare. This is not about uh, life; is not just about that. L'argent fait pas le bonheur, and so on, which which we know. Uh, and as he says, uh, you know, being alive contributes to your welfare. <laughs> so uh, that's one element. They also uh, look at, uh, you know, ill health, social isolation, marriage, family income and wealth, and in fact, show that uh, there is a deterioration uh, when you look at the educational gap in all these things. But this is not uh, uh, the half of the paper. The half of the paper is uh, the thing in the red there. Okay, so why uh, do they work on this? Uh, because it is true, I've always found that reading the newspaper in the, in the US versus here, uh, here you very often compare people with a university degree or without a university degree. Uh, while in the US, it's an obsession. Uh, you know, Trump voters are mostly non-college degree people. Democrats, uh, they receive votes mostly from the cultural elites and so on. And on. So, so indeed, whether it's in politics, in economics, in demographics, society more broadly, this is a huge thing. As I will argue at the end of my presentation, it's funny that they don't say anything then about should we maybe change the way universities are organized? Uh, and in a sense, I start feeling better uh, with respect, as I will argue, about our universities, even though they have all their problems, uh, the envelope fermé, the fact that uh, we are not funded enough and so on. But maybe uh, even though they have the best research universities in the world, maybe there's something that is missing there. But anyway, so um, as I said, uh, clearly uh, the college, non-college, uh, distinction is important for voting patterns, for wealth, for incarceration. Prisons are full of people without college degrees. Marriage rates have fallen much faster for non college degree people. And, uh, and as they say, you know, non college people are important. It's two thirds of the population. So it's not a tiny number of people. Um, and therefore, uh, as they say, documenting differences in mortality between groups provides evidence on in one measure of how well society is functioning beyond aggregate measures of material well-being. That's very strange. How well? So, sorry? How well? It's strange, no? You mean how well or, or badly? Oh, yes, yeah. how badly? That's right. Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, uh, the uh, how well it could be very well or very badly. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, so. Uh, okay. Now, um, now then they defend why it makes sense to, to compare people uh, with respect to, uh, with respect to uh, death, as they say. And, and a lot of this, by the way, is straight out of their, uh, is copied from their, uh, <laughs> From their article, it's not just, it's they speaking more than me, c'est à dire. Um, so money-based money measures of well-being depend on often controversial assumptions about what to include, how to convert money to real measures, all these kind of things. We know that 
DDP is an imperfect measure of uh, even material well-being. As they say, uh, mortality is an objective measure, less subject to measurement error, someone is dead or alive. <laughs> Uh, and there is little debate around which is better. So indeed, <laughs> even though some people commit suicide. Um, now, death is a particular indicative of a societal failure when it's not due to a widespread infectious disease like COVID-19. Indeed, uh, different societies were hit or less hit um, by COVID-19 due at times to uh, geographical density, availability of masks. I mean, things that are not necessarily uh, structural. Um, now, they also argue that uh, there is a difference between failures in the medical system. By the way, they are very critical and they should be about the um, medical system in the, in the US, which I think is very good if you have money to get access and on average, and by the way, here, uh, looking at adult life expectancy is already favoring the US because the US is very bad in infant mortality. So uh, I think they are, I think, worse than Cuba, for example, so, uh, the, uh, which is a much poorer country. But so anyway, uh, what they argue also is that it's even worse if the system, society, leads you to... Uh, to commit suicide, uh, become an alcoholic or a drug addict. And so the idea of the paper here is to give you some numbers about the various causes of death. Um, so methodologically, um, as I say, uh, they start with, and the, the graph you, you saw uh, talks about life expectancy at age 25 or adult life expectancy, um, the number of years someone can expect to live beyond the 25th birthday if mortality rates were to remain at their current level. So indeed, this life expectancy, even though it's called expectancy, is not a forecast. Mortality rates will change, but it's a convenient summary of age-specific mortality rates, a single number that aggregates to many uh, age-specific rates. Uh, and indeed, the assumption here that could be refined is that uh, people either get a BA before 25 or yeah, before 25 or not, which indeed, definitely in our country would not be a good idea. But I think our country, uh, you know, in the US, it's so expensive to go to college uh, that you have a lot of selection. And the problem is not people remaining uh, students for years or decades. <laughs> uh, I think it's very important. If we were, if we would want to do this kind of thing in Belgium, we would need to think seriously about that. So, but uh, have, for uh, them, it's so obvious that it costs uh, tons of money to do a year uh, of uh, study that they don't even mention the fact that uh, uh, you have these students that become uh, really long-term. On the other hand, some people start later, and therefore uh, they will do, do they have data about self-selection to university? Um, they, they don't talk about that. Um, I guess uh, well, it's a 54-page it's a paper that uh, I recommend. And I don't claim to have mastered all the details. Now, the paper works with death certificates, which record age, sex, and the highest education attained. And then the paper makes extensive use of underlying cause of death rather than proximate. And underlying cause of death is the, under, the, the underlying cause is the disease or injury which initiated the train of morbid events leading directly or indirectly to death or to the circumstances of the accident or violence which produced the fatal injury. And uh, as they, they say, uh, for people that are very old, it's difficult to 
record the underlying cause of death, and there are lots of errors, and therefore they only look at uh, life expectancy or mortality rates until 85. So they, they don't look at people uh, beyond 85. Um, and then the paper uses standard life table methods to calculate life expectancy at age 25, an age by which uh, they assume uh, people have completed their education. Uh, you've already seen this picture, um, which I think is quite striking. I think it's a big fact that they, they document. Uh, then they make international comparisons, but the international comparisons, uh, since they want uh, data that are comparable, uh, they, they go back to, um, to life expectancy at birth. And uh, they do that for college grads, uh, and they do that so for the average. And uh, they say, look, you know, uh, this is, the, uh, this is uh, for the average population. Uh, and you see that the US in 1980, and of course, you know, okay, they are Democrats, they don't like uh, the Reagan revolution, and I tend to agree with them, but, uh, but okay. Uh, the, so they start with 1980, and indeed, in um, when you look at the different countries, and I will come to these countries in a second, you see that the US was in the middle of the pack uh, in 1980, and is now really, really an outlier, even if you forget about COVID. Uh, and then they show Portugal, but even though it's there, but there, <laughs> two Portuguese in a room. Uh, <laughs> And uh, by the way, Portugal also did well in uh, in COVID, but uh, but anyway, in vaccine, number one in vaccination. But uh, so I think this picture is striking. But we cannot associate that to the Reagan Revolution. He was elected in eighty four, so the effects would no nineteen eighty nineteen eighty. Ah, it was eighteen the first time. Okay, then. And, uh, then yeah. But well, everybody is talking about the Thatcher Reagan Revolution uh, as kind of a big. Uh, Jump to the right in terms of economics, and in particular, one thing that has been important is that he has immediately made uh, uh, labor like, like, labor legislation much less pro-union, and uh, it has in, in, increased inequality a lot on the labor market. But so anyway, so this is um, they also have a picture in the paper where they put the two curves, um, college and non-college, and show that in fact the college uh, the college curve is pretty close with Japan. Um, now I think there are obvious things about uh, longevity that is will include uh, you know uh, smoking, drinking, uh, diet, uh, plus of course the way the um, the way the, the system uh, health system is, is working. But I think it's the evolution that is uh, quite uh, quite striking. Um, so if you want, uh, so in terms of numbers, so I already mentioned 2.6. The difference was 2.6 in the US between college and college, 2.6 years in 92, and 8.5 in 2021. If we forget about COVID, it's still 6.3. So that's a lot. Uh, by the way, it, in some countries, other countries, it has also increased. So it's not as if uh, uh, everything is rosy elsewhere, but uh, but clearly what you see in the US is more, more striking and it hurts the average a lot. In terms of the performance, so Japan is on top. Uh, countries in order of life expectancy, Japan on top, then Switzerland, Spain, Korea, Italy, Australia, Sweden, Norway, France, Ireland, Canada, Netherlands, Austria, Finland, Portugal, Belgium, New Zealand, Greece, Denmark, and UK. By the way, the UK is not great. And again, maybe the Thatcher Revolution. Now, Belgium is not that great either. Uh, I remember uh, this professor in, uh, in Leuven, Eric Stockhart, who's a health economist, who once showed me a survey of the Belgian system and so that was not about 
not about uh, life expectancy, but about uh, the performance, the outcomes of uh, uh, operations and stuff like that. And uh, that uh, what was striking, he said, was that we are average in terms of Western Europe on these indicators, uh, but people are very happy about the system because they have a lot of choice. So they think we are very good. So I think there is selection, knowing, depending on whom you know, you may get better access. But, but anyway, let's, uh, let's forget about that. So, um, and as I say, uh, looking at America, only at Americans with a college degree, they remain very near the top relative to whole population numbers of other rich countries until COVID uh, to the US. Uh, but uh, it's definitely worse than Japan in terms of COVID. So, so it's really a dual system. And I remember 15, 20 years ago, somebody, a health economist from Stanford saying, look, you know, conditional on being alive at 65, the US had the highest life expectancy. Of course, a lot of people were dead by then. So <laughs> it's, um, it's not that the US, uh, they don't have good doctors. Uh, you just have to have access. Okay, um, now these are the big facts. The next table, which I think is maybe the most interesting for this seminar, uh, looks at the evolution and decomposition of age-adjusted mortality per 100,000 people, age 25, 84. As I say, we stop at 84 because the view is underlying cause of death is hard to assess if you are, you know, 110. <laughs> um, so the computation, uh, yeah, that's what I said. And uh, as they say, the advantage of age-adjusted mortality is that it's linear in both age-specific population and causes of death, which allows for an exact decomposition. So basically, uh, if you die of something uh, at 83, well, then you're dead for two years. If you die at, uh, at 25, you're dead for 60 years. So. Uh, and then you sum all these things, uh, and uh, therefore, you know, suicide counts more than the number of people because they die very young, possibly. Okay, so that's the. Uh, so if we, this is what has led some people to say that you cannot just count the number of deaths from COVID because these are all very old people. So in terms of uh, age adjusted mortality, maybe it was not that bad. I'm not. Uh, I'm not taking sides here, but the, the point is, it's not the same, like the, the Spanish flu killed mostly young people. Uh, it's not exactly the same thing, uh, even though I don't want to enter into the debate. Uh, so what are the numbers? So I think this is, uh, uh, so, and I just uh, put, uh, as I said, I, I forget about the last two years, the COVID years. So 1992, 2019, and uh, each time, uh, population with a BA and without a BA. Uh, and uh, in red, the difference between BA and no BA in 1992, and the difference between BA and no BA in uh, 2019. Uh, and you have the age adjusted mortality. At the bottom, the total mortality, and you see that uh, uh, 845 for BA and uh, 1056 for no BA, so a difference of, uh, let's say, a good 20%. Uh, and then you see that in 2019, when things have improved in total, uh, 845 went to 462, but uh, no, so that has improved a lot for a BA, while without a BA, you go from 1056 to, uh, uh, to only 908. So you see that the, the age-adjusted mortality has uh, become only half for people with a BA, while it was 80% uh, uh, of, um, of the... Uh, uh, in 1992. Okay, so uh, the while the the levels have gone down, 
the difference has been multiplied by more than two, from 211 to 445. So massive. Uh, then what I, I put, and they have a couple more columns, uh, the uh, rows, uh, the first six rows are the top contributors in terms of the difference in 2019. Uh, so what are, the uh, diseases responsible for the difference. First, DOD, death of despair. As you will see, death of despair, they put in the next slide uh, drugs, so in particular the opioid crisis, alcohol, and suicide. Uh, they don't put, by the way, uh, tobacco in the, in the drug part. And uh, uh, but I guess it has to do, I think, with the fact that, uh, you know, first of all, it was something that people used to do, not because, uh, not because uh, they were, you know, desperate. Uh, the, just like having a glass of wine doesn't mean, it's not, does not lead to a death of despair. Um, but so my, my point is simply that, um, and I'll come back to that when we talk about so death of despair, cancer, cardiovascular disease, respiratory, diabetes, Alzheimer's, okay? Um, so um, the, uh, in fact, uh, for the top, it's the top five diseases that are responsible for the biggest differences in 2019. I've also added Alzheimer because Alzheimer is a bit specific. Uh, but uh, there, uh, you uh, you see that it's the, big, it's the only disease that uh, in uh, 1992 uh, struck uh, people with a VA more than without, and that's because they live longer. And uh, so, but anyway, so death of despair. Uh, you see, uh, so again, it's drugs. Uh, suicides and um, and uh, alcohol, 26.43. So uh, you have uh, people of BA, and I guess uh, uh, were struck more than that than people without the BA. But of course, things have exploded for people without the BA in 2019 compared to uh, 1992, while it has been reasonably stable. In green, I put what has increased uh, over the period. Uh, and mostly it's not green for the big numbers, uh, for the people with a BA. Uh, but you have a lot of green for people without a BA. Obviously, cancer and uh, cardiovascular diseases are important. Uh, what you see is that uh, there have been improvements over time for both categories of diseases, but the improvement has been much sharper for people with a BA than without a BA. And I guess this has to do uh, with uh, maybe at times uh, food, tobacco and so on, and also, of course, access to, to good care, okay? Um, but so you see that uh, while you could say that if they, of course, if they were to go down by the same percentage, the difference would also go down by the same percentage. But no, the difference has increased. So, uh, so things have improved a lot more for people who are doing better than before already. Uh, respiratory, uh, it's less deadly, but again, the same thing. Diabetes, uh, the same thing, even though, interestingly, uh, you don't see that much action uh, in, the, uh, in this column. And then Alzheimer uh, is becoming more important. Of course, that's due to the fact that we die less young <laughs> from cancer or cardiovascular. Uh, and there you see that in the beginning, uh, it affected people with a BA more than without because they were living longer, but now it has changed. 
Yeah, just a word about Alzheimer. It's not only because we live longer, but we have better tools for making uh, differential diagnosis, yeah. which was very hard to do before. And now it's really okay. beginning to be more reliable. Okay, okay. No, no, it's, it's a good point. Uh, and maybe they mentioned it, but I don't think so. <laughs> uh, some of these, I mean, even though uh, underlying attributing that to an underlying cause below 85 is easier, it's not perfect. And so uh, there are clearly there uh, things. So, okay, so these are the, uh, and you see, the, when you look at the uh, increase, the big increase in uh, in uh, adjusted age adjusted mortality for people without a bachelor, bachelor degree uh, is by far these deaths of despair that went from 43 to 95. And there, uh, as I say, it's drugs, suicide, and alcohol. And uh, the question is uh, whether, of course, it's not necessarily a huge number of people because they die quite young, possibly. Uh, but still, uh, it's quite a, quite a high number for age-adjusted mortality. And of course, you see that the uh, the uh, uh, the drug part, the opioid crisis, is the biggest uh, by by far going from six to 45, um, people without a BA tend to uh, commit suicide and die of alcoholism more than the others. Uh, for the others, things are not really improving. It's stable. For drugs, it's going up a bit. Uh, but uh, people without a BA uh, uh, die from that more. Um, now, yes, uh, but, so this might, I don't know if they discuss it, might by itself be an underestimated problem, right? Because when you talk about the drugs, this actually reveals only the mortality, but you can have people who are in a very severe problem which are not dead, but they it might be morbidity, morbidity. That's right. So yeah, yeah. it might be actually more severe for the non DAs, and DA is just difficult to know even later. Do right? so they discuss it with you or this is? They, as you will see at the end, they talk a bit about mobility, but uh, you know it's a sciatic pain. So it's not. Uh, the question is, how do you uh, are you able? You know, and I don't know about all the data, these things, uh, and of course anything that connects to. So they talk also about extreme stress and uh, and uh, so what you will see, and they go very fast. Uh, this is not a paper that uh, that treats that uh, that brings really new things on that front. Okay, um, so methodological remark, we talked a bit about this already, the percentage of population age 25, 84 with a BA has increased huh? from 22% to 92 to 35 now. The implication of such an evolution is unclear on these gaps. Um, for example, if people who start earning BAs are healthier, than people without a BA, but less healthy than the population with a BA, uh, that will lower the average, uh, not wealth, but health of both groups. But the impact on the mortality gap might, might go either way. Their conclusion is that it doesn't change their results. Let me not, I have not investigated that uh, in a, uh, by the way, the paper uh, is published, is going to be published in the Brookings Papers on Economic Activity which is a policy-oriented journal, uh, which is not one of these journals with anonymous referees and the like. It's more, they have referees, but they know each other, and it's kind of friendly and uh, kind of, you know, policy, uh, which is, but it looks at big things. Therefore, it's interesting to, uh, to see. Okay. Um, so, what they also document is that while the pattern of mortality changed a lot since 1992, the increase in the educational mortality gap occurred for both men and women and for all causes of death, including COVID, with one exception, for example, uh, lung cancer for men, where things have improved over the years because basically the no VA population started quitting later and therefore uh, 
It's just like you know the the difference uh, uh, between men and women has partly gone down when women started uh, to uh, to smoke. And um, now then they become they start discussing a bit uh, uh, why is all this happen. They cite. Uh, people who talk about fundamental cause theory. So whenever there exists means to prevent death, those means would be more effectively seized by those with power and resources. Uh, and indeed they show that there is a strong positive correlation over the period between the, the uh, education wage premium, so the college premium and the death of despair premium. So indeed people uh, without bachelor degrees are uh, destroyed on the job market and therefore that leads to uh, all these problems. Um, they show that indeed uh, people without a BA have, uh, uh, have had uh, a much more precipitous fall in marriage rates. Now, you know, whether or not uh, you have to get married to uh, live together is a question which depends on society, but, but okay. Uh, uh, you know, living alone does not make you richer. That's, a, that's the bottom line. Uh, increasing excess, uh, extreme mental stress. I guess that's what you were uh, partly talking about, Gani, um, for people with LBA. Uh, excess psychic pain, uh, excess difficulty of socializing, and so on. Huh? You know, I, I, I saw once in a newspaper in the New York Times that uh, the main reason for for supporting actively Donald Trump was that you felt alone. So uh, these things, uh, you know, and of course the US is, uh, is uh, a society which is much, much tougher than ours. So conclusion, uh, first conclusion of the paper documents the gaps between those with and without the college, not just one uh, dimension of well-being, such as mortality rates, but more pervasive. Uh, wherever one looks, one group is doing better than the other. Sometimes the college educated are doing well and the non-college educated are doing worse. Uh, at Wait. times they are both improving, but the better educated are improving faster. So exactly. it's quite pervasive. Wait, uh, it's a... And uh, we have... Wait. Would Michelle make like to make a comment or? Oh, no, he's muted himself. Oh, okay, uh, but you know, happy to hear your comments, Michelle. <laughs> uh, second conclusion: Why is this happening? And then they become a bit more. Uh, they connect to their uh, earlier work and bigger picture. Uh, they say, well, there is the effect of globalization and automation without a European style safety net. So they are left of center in the US, uh, which you know I would agree with, of course, but uh, okay. Uh, then uh, they, um, indeed, they, they say, look, the problem is that uh, uh, globalization automation creates a lot of risks. And then if you run a world where your health insurance is attached to uh, mm -hmm. your job and you lose your job, it's a disaster, mm -hmm. like that. Um, the, uh, and then, uh, of course, they, uh, they cite and it started with Reagan 1980, uh, the increase in corporate power relative to workers, decline of unions, spread of big firms, uh, decreased mobility of workers from less to more successful places. If you live uh, in an industrial town, your house is worth nothing and you cannot buy uh, sell it and buy something in the city where the jobs are and so on. Um, and uh, then they, they say that next to these things, so they, they basically argue that we, the US should rethink its commitment to globalization, its welfare state, uh, and its uh, labor relations. Uh, and then they say, well, uh, there is probably also something in the labor market that doesn't work properly is that uh, in order to get a job, having a bachelor degree is seen as a necessity. And uh, that's probably not reasonable. Uh, it's uh, uh, 
it's not, it's just a screening device. And therefore they say they are encouraged by efforts by both public and private employers to, to remedy this. Uh, and it's a low cost policy that could have large benefits. I don't disagree with this. I think, uh, you know, even at USB, you, uh, you have been an inflation of, uh, uh, you cannot get any job at USB without uh, at least a three year bachelor. And for many jobs in the administration, you need five years. So does that make sense? We can discuss, but, uh, but anyway, so, is there a... But, uh, Michel has put up his hand. Okay, Michel. Michel is on the moon. <laughs> well, Hello? Now is not a bad time to ask a question. So I've now finished the presentation of the paper. I will then uh, give some, some comments of mine, but uh, we still have... 43 minutes and uh, discussion, uh, either you wait a bit for my own comments or you already asked for some, some questions. Uh, Michel? Yes, uh, good morning. Do, do you, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for this presentation. I think it's it's really a perfect topic for I3H. It's, it's really amazing to see this mix between economics and what well, I would say healthcare. Um, perhaps one first comment, which was already alluded to, is you know the the relationship between morbidity and and mortality. And I'm a bit surprised that um, obesity didn't appear in um, in in the discussion or in the data that were recorded, we know that obesity is a well, is a major risk factor for many diseases that that were listed, including cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, uh, diabetes, um, etc. And we know that obesity is a, is really a an epidemic in um, in the U.S. And I'm wondering whether there has been a comparison between uh, the the rate of obesity or the degree of obesity comparing BA and non BA. I think it's a it's a very good point. My reading of their paper is that they don't mention it. Of course, they I'm sure that on underlying cause of death, obesity is not part of it. It is indeed uh, diabetes. It is. Uh, uh, cardiovascular, it is cancer, but but you're quite right. I think uh, it would be uh, a very natural uh, thing to, to look at. Um, and I must admit, I should go back to the paper, but I don't think they, they mentioned it at all. In one of the papers no, the, the... Uh, that Antonio sent yesterday, I'm trying to find it again, there was this uh, data. Yeah, Michel? No, I, I just think that you know to discuss this further, we have to to understand why there is this this increased incidence of um, this disease leading to mortality. Obviously, you mentioned the access to healthcare, but that for me is just not just part of the equation. And I think that we should really reflect on the uh, you know on what. It means in terms of preventing those diseases, for example, for respiratory disease, we know that air pollution is important. So perhaps non-BA are more exposed to uh, a bad environment. But I really think that um, diet and obesity should be the first thing to look at. Yeah, yeah. No, no, fully agree, fully agree. So I, I'm not finding back the, the thing that I was reading. Uh, food wasn't a big difference across many European countries. Uh, cigarette was a big difference. But that was about Europe and not the US. I, so the funny thing is OECD data dropped the, OEC, the, the US from the comparison systematically. <laughs> okay. It's all so-called Europe, and then they compare with Korea, etc. But not uh... okay. No, no. But I think it's a, it would be an important thing to to investigate. We, um, I guess it's 
it's also well, as I said, now that the fact that they they put alcohol in the death of despair, uh, but not tobacco, is a choice some level because tobacco is also a drug. <laughs> uh, and there is one thing, uh, you know, uh, smoking one cigarette a week versus uh, three packs a day, and so on. Yes. Um, okay. So now maybe some. First, we go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I, I have a general comment on uh, this approach, which I think very interesting. But for some factors, I was wondering whether it's not a kind of a unilateral view because they seem to consider that at the theoretical level, if you have not your uh, bachelor degree, then you have met your chances to be, let's say, a drug addict or whatever. Uh, but it might be the other way around as well. I mean, if whatever uh, your you know degree or the degree you could achieve mm -hmm. for a drug addict, then you lessen, of course, the probability to get it. So do they ever consider that it might be, of course, maybe the way you were commenting on might be the principal way, but that there could be some... Reverse causation, yeah. Exactly. No, no, he, he does discuss that. Uh, and clearly, with respect to, to drugs, uh, it's, of course, uh, very, very important. Um, now, they... Uh, but I, I think some some people have done uh, you know much you know it's an interesting in terms of the the debate and by the way with Larry Summers they discussed that uh, you know doing something extremely rigorous on a smaller topic on which you have very good data versus looking at the bigger picture even <laughs> data and method are not as good uh, I think we should do both. Uh, and they do mention some uh, the selection problem that indeed the people, it's not the same people who arrive uh, at uh, 25. It's not just that they are the same, but with or without a degree. The fact that they have a degree or not tells us something which will influence their situation. And so uh, I think in particular, he mentions. Uh, Amy Finkelstein, who has written some papers on these other things. So, indeed, th there are selection effects. Um, the uh, they argue reasonably persuasively that uh, okay, um, the big picture is robust. The result is robust. But, uh, but indeed, it's not uh, it's not perfect. Um, well, you know, the perfect thing would be. Uh, you do a randomized controlled trial where you give drugs to one person randomly <laughs> and not to the other, and then see what happens. But uh, that, of course, is complicated. In, for many, many things in health, you know, vaccines, you can do this. Vaccines versus placebo, even though this does not prevent, uh, prevent conspiracy, conspiracy theory, but for even Big Macs or alcohol or whatever, we cannot do that. So, <laughs> but, um, okay. So some personal comments. Uh, I enjoyed the paper a lot. Um, now, from the in terms of their conclusion about uh, about uh, you know the fact that the U.S. is in this sorry state because of globalization, lack of welfare state, uh, weak unions, blah blah blah. Uh, of course. Uh, they could have added taxation, and I've always been uh, struck by this picture in the uh, size Zuckman book. And by the way, Zuckman uh, was a, a great economist in the Piketty School of Economics, who's coming, thanks to Mikael, uh, at ULB on December 14th. So a little bit of time. So the fact that in the US, Indeed, uh, starting, you see, uh, the 1980, Ronald Reagan, <laughs> the 400 richest families, their, their effective tax rate was 
and uh, the bottom 50%, they were at, uh, at uh, 36%. And in 2018, the bottom 50 had a higher effective tax rate than the 400 richest families. In the world. So these are things we haven't seen, even though Europe uh, has too much tax competition on capital, we haven't seen in Western Europe. But um, uh, now my, from the policy conclusion, what do you do with these numbers, which are pretty awful? Uh, I think the, the case deed on view is quite ambitious. The only politicians uh, two years ago that were favoring this were uh, Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren in the US, so the left of the Democratic Party. I have sympathy for them, but uh, it's hard to get through in the US. Uh, so I think uh, they, could, uh, they could look for easier things to do. Uh, I do think that uh, some of these things, and having looked at uh, in particular uh, at the opioid crisis, uh, you know, there are some specific mistakes that you can avoid. Uh, some US states did much better than others. Uh, so uh, having uh, better health regulation, so it's not easy, but these are things that may be easier to do when you, I mean, they have shown that deaths of despair are really important. And there, that the by far most important was the opioid crisis. You don't need to change the whole United States with the opioid crisis. <laughs> Europe has more left-wing and less left-wing governments, and they've all done better. So maybe not Scotland, but uh, for some reason. But uh, so uh, that is one thing. The other thing, which uh, I will call the elephant in the policy room, <laughs> the, the big absence is, you know, uh, what about uh, higher education? Maybe we could, uh, and by the way, there is this book by um, Claudia Goldin, the latest uh, Nobel laureate, uh, and her husband, Larry Katz. It's also a book by <laughs> a Nobel laureate and uh, partner. Um, they have this very nice book in two, uh, published in 2012, 10, about uh, the fact that uh, there is this race between technology and education. And if you want to avoid exploding inequality, education achievement need to uh, go at least at the same rate, if I may say so, <laughs> as technological development. And the US was extremely educated at the end of World War II compared to other countries, and they have lagged. And the fact that when Barack Obama became president, he was still uh, president of the United States, he was still reimbursing his college debt uh, as a student, you know, what is this? So uh, the US has the best universities in the world according at least to the Shanghai ranking. But they have largely refused to expand their BA admissions. They are not providing mass education. Now, I do think that in our country, uh, we are educating the masses, but with, uh, with uh, gradually massively uh, underfunded system, which I would I'm not great either. But for example, in Northern European universities, uh, Scandinavia, the Netherlands, Switzerland, uh, they have proper funding without paid by the state, so low fees and sufficient access. In fact, 15 years ago, with Philippe Aguillon and others, uh, André Sapir, uh, uh, among others, uh, we had a little uh, report by Bruegel, uh, published by Bruegel on this, and uh, frankly, uh, I was surprised. I was even thinking of sending them an email saying, you know, why the, why am to, are you not talking about this? <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit strange. This being said, Europe is a bit of a paradox. Uh, we have most of... We have data for the impact of the lower, lower funding on access in your parents' income or anything? Well, we... Uh, Okay, in that, 
paper, because then we publish a paper in economic policy, we, we discuss uh, we discuss funding, but more in uh, in research. Uh, now access is uh, something is easy to measure, uh, but uh, anyway, let, let's talk about that maybe maybe later. Um, the one thing I wanted to point here is that okay, Europe. Uh, has most of what Warren, Sanders, Case, and Deaton want, except for excessive and unfair tax competition and capital. Uh, Germany even has workers on their supervisory boards, so it's not as if uh, uh, workers are screwed completely. Income inequality has grown significantly less than in the US, and has been reasonably stable in many of our countries for the last 40 years, according to the World Inequality Report of PKT et al. So we're not talking about right-wingers who are saying that. Uh, but there is still a fair amount of populism, extreme left and especially extreme right. So it's not as if everybody's happy. Uh, and therefore, I think here too, uh, we should look in detail at how our supposed and often, but not always real advantage, especially in health and education are effectively delivered or not. And I know that, you know, for example, in France, where they, they complain a lot about the banlieue and the dual society and the like, the fact that they have these grandes écoles that are as uh, elitist as the top US universities in terms of access may uh, contribute to that. But then it's a much more general thing. I know Michael, again, is, is trying to look at how public goods are delivered at the local level and whether they reach the right people. So it's not it's not as if we are a social democratic paradigm here. So uh, even though the aggregate numbers are not at all like in the U.S. or many other people in the world. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say. And here you have the I guess it would be on the on the web the uh, references. Okay, thank you. And we still have time for discussion, if, uh, if you want. Yeah, my big historical question, but going to your last point about the European populism, do you have the impression that the tendencies in Europe now are reminiscent of the uh, forces that led to rise of uh, Reagan and, uh, and Thatcher in the late 70s? Uh, I mean, like, are we in Europe just lagging behind the same trajectory by 20 years? Uh, or, I mean, of course, it's difficult to predict, but you know, some forces are there. So, this rise of populism, uh, or is it <laughs> very different from the forces that led to, uh, to, to, to Reagan and Hitler? Uh, well, we are, of course, going to uh, <laughs> the very big picture. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think uh, Margaret Thatcher arrived because of the view that uh, a left-wing government, uh, Labour, uh, didn't manage to deal with stagflation and so on, and was kicked up. And it was a pro-market revolution. I hear few people today being pro-market per se. Uh, even Donald Trump is saying, "Look, uh, globalization has gone too far." So. In a sense, there are some agreements <laughs> between what Case and Deaton say and what Trump says, even though, because they're both uh, talking about the globalization, the excess of corporate power over unions. Of course, they differ, A, in the solutions. Uh, Case and Deaton are not racist. <laughs> uh, and plus, uh, Trump is completely hypocrite because he will want to cut the tax rate on the super rich. Yep. So he's, uh, but, uh, but I think, well, Reagan got elected by saying, uh, by saying the government is not the solution, the government is the problem. I think today, uh, when you hear George Louis Boucher say, look, you know, uh, the, the government is a problem giving money to Walloons who uh, don't want to work. I think he's frankly the minority. Uh, I, I do think people are more worried about excessive inequality and stuff like that. Um, of course, there is this question about 
whether migration helps or hurts and so on, uh, which is, but I see more populism on both sides and you know, we have to define what populism is. Uh, if it's what the people want, that's called democracy. <laughs> of course, on the other hand, uh, the, uh, some of the solution can be very unpleasant. Um, but uh, I, I think indeed what uh, the state was very powerful in the 60s, uh, tax rates as well documented by Piketty et al, top tax rates were very high, which is fine with me. And you cannot show that it hurt growth a lot, if you like growth. Um, and so, but still they managed to come. So it was a retreat from the state. I don't think uh, many people here want uh, to uh, have a state retreats there is more nationalism and uh, you know globalization is I think uh, under threat uh, which we may find good or bad uh, but anyway yeah, yeah uh, social, uh, Michel, uh, yes um, I think that I mean your discussion is very much about you know how to reduce the inequality by working, for example, at the access to uh, universities. My vision is that really things start much earlier in life. I mentioned obesity. This is just one example. There might be other, I would say, um, habits that are acquired very early uh, in life. Actually, in the paper that Michael just sent me about uh, Europe, they, they mention uh, body overweight as indeed an important uh, factor. But um, beside uh, uh, obesity and coming back to your comment, uh, for me, the main action um, from a, let's say, a political point of view is really mainly related to education and uh, to health literacy. And I think that to to learn how to live longer, to have a healthier life. This is something that you have to uh, to learn, I would say, even during childhood. And I think this, this is really, for me at least, the main actions to be undertaken. Rather, obviously, in the US, there is also this issue of access to, to health care. I agree. But I think that and even in all countries, a lot of money could be saved by making citizens much more um, conscious of, you know, what they have to do to to maintain uh, their health. That was my comment. Okay, well, fully agree, of course. Uh, they, they don't mention it, I guess, because they... They don't really have data on that. Uh, I guess to connect it to uh, to <laughs> your, uh, to this issue, it would be interesting because typically both people with and without BAs uh, have kids, and uh, what they teach their kids about uh, yeah about, about, uh, food habits and stuff like that would be very important. I, I don't know whether there are uh, there are studies about that because uh, then there is school, of course. But by the way, school in the US, uh, I'm not talking about universities, but let's say elementary school, uh, at some level uh, is not uh, that bad in terms of inequality because uh, it's almost all public because they have this rule that if you're if you want to be privately funded, you will get zero subsidies in contrast to our private school. So I think only 10% of the kids in the US go to private school. Uh, so, uh, and uh, of course, if, if uh, school is locally funded, then uh, you get a lot more tax money in, the, in, uh, in richer neighborhoods. Uh, but, uh, but you're right, uh, this uh, seeing how uh, food habits emerge 
and what we can do about it would be uh, super, super important. Yeah, because uh, again, in terms of education, uh, you imply that the fact that uh, U.S. universities are very selective in terms of the admission might be might be an explanation. But what's the evidence for this? I'm really wondering. Let's say that someone who was, you know, living in in, in an environment or in a family with a low income and so on. Um, with bad for ex habits, you know, for example, in terms of diet, let's say that you offer to those persons access to uh, Harvard. I'm not sure that indeed this will increase so much their life expectancy, but I might be wrong. But, you know, I think that to imply that by, by expanding uh, BA admissions, uh, we will indeed correct these inequalities. I mean, these are still to be demonstrated. Oh, man. No, no, I, I agree with you. First of all, this is only a suggestion, huh? but uh, <laughs> not a, a claim. Uh, but uh, but I do think I think it is interesting this uh, <clears throat> this obsession in the U.S. about uh, did you attend an Ivy League college or not and these kind of things. Uh, these are two separate worlds. While I think one advantage of ULB, especially being in a city where you have uh, people with different different levels of uh, income, and looking at our students, where you still have some uh, quite some uh, variety, uh, that must have an impact. But um, but uh, but I agree with you that uh, at some level, you could argue even in Belgium, it's too late. Uh, these things will not uh, change. Uh, of course, the fact in the US, it's linked then to the fact of having worse jobs without uh, guarantee of health insurance, all these kind of things. That must hurt too. Huh? So, but uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? Yeah, she uh, Yes, so, so I'm, I'm wondering that because you mentioned one solution is like we we can have universal health care provider system, right? But I'm not sure if this uh, because what I experienced is that uh, when all the people can can be reimbursed by the social insurance, so there's going to be a competition or something or something like the moral hazard. But then the if you want to see a specialist here. You have to like wait for, for wait for two months, but for the people who got the first richer, maybe they have more chances for the private uh, uh, private uh, doctors there. So maybe it's gonna, gonna not solve the, the problem of the disparity. Well, you are quite right, of course. That uh, that was it. What is it called the? Uh... I don't, know, I don't find it, but uh, the uh, you're right that in any system, people with more money and more power would get better access. Yeah, and that was why I, I said also oh. here that uh, it was maybe a good idea to look at how exactly our health and education services are effectively delivered, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I do agree that in Belgium today. Uh, waiting lines can be quite long at times, and uh, of course that may lead uh, to some people finding ways to <laughs> to cut the line. Uh, at the same time, I guess you have to evaluate uh, these systems according to outcomes, mm -hmm. and outcomes are obviously not like the catastrophic outcomes in the U.S. I think. Uh, the, uh, but indeed, uh, we should always try and do better and do better in a way uh, that will save our resources. We are already spending more than 10% of GDP on health. The, <clears throat> the US much more than 15, I think, already. And uh, so when Michel says, uh, you know, uh, educating people about how they should eat and so on, uh, that's a very cost, possibly a very cost effective way. And we should, you know, as you know, economists are in favor of looking at cost-benefit analysis. 
So indeed, uh, we need, because let's face it, we have, uh, uh, we have limited resources. Uh, we need, uh, and with aging, things won't improve. Mm -hmm. With uh, we need to pay for the climate transition. We should give uh, <coughs> some more money to to a European army, given the difficulties around. Uh, so so indeed, uh, value for money is the key. Yeah. Um, so, but I agree with you that uh, we should look at how people adapt to the system. Yeah. yeah. Uh, bouncing back on Michel's uh, point about food uh, and uh, starting with a joke, uh, there was this joke I read many years ago with uh, the kind of food you were eating, the kind of fats, you eat bread, etc. And then the language of the country and uh, countries with high or low life expectancy were eating fats, were eating bread, and so on. Uh, the difference was English. If you were English speaking, your life expectancy was much lower. Um, so that was the starting joke. Uh, if you look at the, is it map, a joke or a fact? It's a, it's a, <laughs> I think it may be a fact, by the way, that the life expectancy is low in England and uh, in the US. It was a fact, but then they were using, of course, and picking some variables of, of types of food. Yesterday, I was looking at a map of Europe. Life expectancy, for instance, in France, is actually higher in the south than in the north of France. And uh, you have the same in uh, around the, uh, the Mediterranean, Mediterranean where uh, Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece have actually good performance. And so I think that's a big difference with the US, where uh, I was reading that if you are in small villages, lost, where typically very poor in the US, you don't even have access to fresh fruits because they don't sell. So they, they don't even have access to to, to good food. I think in Belgium, a lot of immigration comes from the Mediterranean. It actually has better uh, diets than what we may have as, uh, as Belgians. And in Europe, the poorer parts of, the, of Europe actually have better food as well. And that compensates compared to the US. It, it, like rough uh, looks at, at maps, etc. I don't have a causal. Uh, but I think the problem is uh, compounded in the US the fact that cheap food is hamburgers. Here, if you're in a poor country, cheap food is fruits, uh, fresh fish, and so on. Yeah. Well, well, well. Turn away my... You touch yourself. Oh, right. I, I, thought, <laughs> I thought... I thought... I thought you were Portuguese. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? All, they, are, they are all fishermen. <laughs> yes. I... I, I <laughs> I thought that bio was synonymous with expensive, but is that true? I, I, for what I read, bio is not uh, synonymous with quality food. So, and and anyway, anyway. I, I didn't see any link between uh, organic food and life uh, or diseases. I, so Michel knows better, but for the, li the, the little I've read, the, the evidence is uh, about zero. Okay. No, no, but I think indeed uh, next to, and I guess that's part of what uh, Case and Deaton are saying, it is much bigger than the healthcare system. It's about uh, yeah. behavior, including suicidal behavior and, and, and so on. So it's, uh, and indeed, uh, but I guess I'm sure that, uh, and of course obesity would be a super important problem. I guess it's lack of data. Uh, it's, but obesity doesn't seem to be, even though, by the way, they also do more detailed uh, studies, uh, including type of cancer and all these kind of things. Huh? So, uh, but I don't think they have obesity, and I think it has to do with the fact that it's not an underlying cause of of death. But, but the, uh, the fact is that the stars are very badly aligned. It seems. In the no, US, there are. Uh, whereas it uh, kind of neutralizes. And maybe that's no, why. And, uh, and I've always, when I, yeah, when I, yeah. when I was going to Burger King, when I was in the U.S. because for a long time, a long time, Burger King was not here, and I think it's much better than Freak or uh, my view. But uh, <laughs> and I used to go, and it was striking how cheap it was and how people looked really poor. 
so uh, while here it's full of kids and so on, so I think it's different. But by the way, it's connected to Michelle. <laughs> they should be taught that it's not great for their health. <laughs> anyway, okay, well, thanks a lot.